Thank you, Claude. Okay, I think we have enough people uh, joining here so we can get started. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to another community meeting. Um, this is our combined November and December meeting uh, just because of the holidays and people uh, are going to be like traveling and stuff. So we're just combining the meetings uh, and doing one for both months. And then the next one is going to be in January, in the end of January. So people can, can do their projects during their vacations. Um, so before we get into our two presentations today, we have two uh, very nice guests that, that agreed to present here for us with very interesting content. I'll just go over some announcements to start with. Um, as always, like add your name to, to the attendees list um, if you can. And then um, I'll, I'll do some announcements. Uh, we're going to have the two presentations, about 20 minutes each one. Then we are going to go over some news. And if you have anything that you want to talk about, if we have time in the end, uh, just you know, add items here to the agenda and uh, we'll get to it if we have time. So starting with the announcements, um, I just wanted to let people know that the garden release timeline is public now. It's on this public issue here. Um, so you can see the dates for feature freeze, code freeze, tutorial party. Um, these are all tentative dates. We're gonna try to stick to it, but um, if we see any problems with it uh, during the development cycle, we may change. And a reminder that the garden uh, distribution is gonna be the first one that we are taking one year to, to release. So it's gonna be one year from Fortress, which came um, uh, a couple months ago this year. So we still have a long time until garden comes up. Um, then also related to Garden, uh, I don't know if people are aware of how we choose uh, what versions of each library are going to go into each one of the of the collections. So we started opening these tickets to make this just a little bit more publicly visible um, and to give people some context, like why is Ignition Math 6 used on all of the all of the collections, but Ignition Gazebo is always changing versions, right? So um, here there's some context about why we're doing it. For example, for Garden, we already uh, increased the version of Ignition Rendering and all its dependencies, and that's because Ignition Rendering needed uh, some breaking changes related to wide-angle cameras. Other breaking changes may come. Um, so that forced us to use Ignition Rendering 7, GUI 7, Sensor 7, Gazebo 7, and Launch 6 on Garden. Uh, and there are other three pro proposals here that are probably going to go through unless someone has um, big issues with it. So we're going to bump the version of Ignition Messages and everything that comes after it, Ignition Common, as well as Ignition Math. So it's going to be our first bump in Ignition Math in a long time. If people have been following, we've been using Ignition Math 6 from Acropolis to Fortress. All of them use the same version of Ignition Math, and we're thinking of uh, bumping that version for uh, garden. So if you have opinions and stuff, these are public tickets that anyone can comment on. And the last thing that I wanted to mention is that DOM, the, the DOM distribution is going to EOL at the end of this year in December. Uh, after the end of December, like in the beginning of January, we're not maintaining DOM anymore. We're going to make one last release uh, and then just archive the repository, the, the branches related to DOM. Uh, repositories that are DOM specific are going to be archived and uh, all of the Debian uh, like releases that are there are going to remain available, but they're going to be fixed at that last version. We're not going to be supporting and pushing any changes to them anymore. Um, that's it for announcements. So we can jump right into our presentation. So today we have two uh, guests here. We're going to start with Martin Petska, who is going to be talking about tracked vehicles and uh, how he implemented tracked vehicles for Gazebo Classic and now more recently for Ignition Gazebo. Uh, very exciting uh, presentation coming up. And then uh, we're going to go with Jay, Jay Young, uh, who's going to be talking about the PX4 autopilot integration into Ignition Gazebo. So let's start with Martin. Uh, the floor is yours. Feel free to present your screen. OK. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, as Luis said, I'm Martin Betzka, and I'm going to tell you something about uh, how track vehicles work and can work in Gazebo. So uh, let's jump right in. Uh, there has been support for track vehicles in Gazebo Classic since 2019 if you used uh, Open Dynamics Engine. And uh, this year, I also ported that support to Ignition Gazebo, starting with Citadel with throughout all the future versions. Uh, and that is only in connection with Dart. 
uh, this support is kind of like highly physics engine dependent. So this is why uh, it is interesting to also specify the dynamics engine that is used. Uh, you may ask like, hey, haven't I already seen some tracked vehicles in Gazebo? And uh, you would be right. Yeah, this is, for example, the SubT simulator, one of the team robots. But you can see that even though this is a tracked vehicle, it has kind of like very big problems climbing, not that very high bump. And uh, you can even see that the motion of the vehicle is kind of like much more bumpy than you would expect from a tracked vehicle. And that's because it is actually not a tracked vehicle. This is a wheeled vehicle. And uh, wheels instead of tracks are one of the most favorite workarounds uh, to get something like tracks uh, into a simulator that doesn't natively support tracks. And just to limit the scope of this presentation, uh, I'm talking about non-deformable tracks. So uh, those on the left and in the middle, I call like deformable tracks because the outer shape of the track can change if the robot bumps on some obstacles. Uh, whereas non-deformable tracks has these kinds of like solid infills, which prevent the track from changing the outer shape. And that is the thing that is best simulated with the presented plugins. But you can, of course, use the plugins also for the deformable tracks, uh, knowing that there is some kind of like approximation and that the track will actually not behave exactly as the real one would. So I was talking about workarounds. So let's, let's look first at the workarounds. Uh, one of the easiest things you can do if you don't know how to simulate tracks is to turn off friction. And if you turn off friction and treat the robot just as a point mass, and apply some external force to the point mass, it can look like uh, it is actually moving on the tracks. But uh, as you can imagine, this comes with a lot of uh, approximations and bugs. For example, slippage of such vehicle is uh, not simulatable in this case. Also, the dynamics can get pretty much wrong because you are just applying force, you know, and uh, nothing like the real uh, track soil interaction can step in. So this is one of the easiest workarounds, uh, but not very good one. Uh, then the most famous one, the wheels workaround. Uh, this is uh, in the video, you can actually see how the tracks look like if you visualize the collisions. And as you can see, the motion of such vehicle is like, yeah, this is the physically correct uh, motion induced by rotating something that uh, is actually touching the ground. But the motion of such vehicle on obstacles is very bumpy and very unrealistic. So uh, this is like one of the better options, but still not very good. And frankly, if you have a tracked vehicle, you probably don't want to drive it on flat ground. You know, tracked vehicles are for obstacles. And if it doesn't behave well on obstacles, then it's uh, better to use a wheel obstacle, uh, wheeled vehicle. Then uh, there is this like another, it's not no longer a workaround. It might come like uh, the, most suitable model for some robots. Uh, and that is simulating the track as a chain of very small links uh, chained together and applying some like real torque to, to some of the chain links uh, to make them rotating. Uh, this is kind of like good if you have a lot of time to tune it. This is an example from VRAP uh, where someone probably put a lot of effort into making this vehicle work. And as you can see, yeah, it's possible to make it work and uh, it looks pretty much exciting for me. But uh, if you don't have that much time or that much expertise, uh, it can also end up like this. So you can see that the Dynamics engine has hard time keeping all the links together. Uh, there are many like uh, spaces between them or dynamic waves happening on the, on the track. And it's all like very difficult to handle correctly. And it might also be specific to the environment where you tune the parameters and then the vehicle comes to a different uh, <clears throat> world and uh, the track will behave insanely. So I was always looking for something that's both easier to simulate, but more faithful regarding the motion of the robot. And to start uh, explaining how the model works, uh, let's first talk about the instantaneous center of rotation, which is a term used uh, with correct vehicle motion. And it's basically a center of a circle that the robot is going around uh, when it has some non-zero angular velocity. 
Uh, with normal skid steering wheeled vehicles, it would be like a, just the diameter of the circle would depend just on the turning radius. Uh, here with track vehicles, there is a coefficient called steering efficiency, which is between zero and one and somehow represents how much does the vehicle slip when it's turning. So this is a kind of like coefficient that's uh, um, determining how far the instantaneous center of rotation will be given the angular rotation of the robot. And as you, as you already heard, uh, this model uh, with the more precise uh, track geometry is implemented in both gazebos, in gazebo classic and in ignition gazebo. Uh, this model allows to use basically any shape of track you can imagine. And uh, in most cases, it should simulate more or less reliably uh, what the real track of that shape would do. Uh, if you want to read up uh, on the details, uh, you can look into our IRS 2017 paper on fast simulation of vehicles with non-deformable tracks. And here I try to just distill like the very core idea of uh, the simulation model. It consists of two parts. Uh, the first part that's needed is uh, changing the friction direction because normally direction of friction in each contact point is uh, devised by the simulator or the dynamics engine somehow like automatically. Uh, but for the track vehicles, for the plugin to work, we need to uh, specify the friction direction so that it is tangent to the circle around the instantaneous center of rotation. So if you do it like this, then the vehicle will actually turn. If you would not do this, <clears throat> all of the friction directions would basically point forward from the robot and turning would be very difficult because the friction is uh, adopted or used or maybe misused, as you will see in the second part. So normally when the vehicle touches ground, uh, there is a normal force that's repelling the vehicle from the ground. And there is the weight force of the vehicle uh, that it's uh, induced by gravity. And if you add up these two forces, you get the lower right arrow. This is like the, the force that's acting on the vehicle. And if there is friction, there is also the friction force that is opposite to the sum of the normal and weight force. And the friction force tries to actually cancel any motion of the vehicle uh, induced by the normal and weight force. And uh, what we do in this model for simulating tracks is kind of like use or misuse this equation, because normally the equation is, okay, compute me uh, such friction force that uh, the relative motion of the two bodies will be zero. And in this model, we say, okay, we don't want the relative motion of the bodies to be zero, but to be, for example, 0 0.2. And then the dynamics engine tries to figure out all the forces that's, that are involved so that the resulting force induces a vehicle velocity of 0 0.2 relative to the ground. This is kind of like not the very, very uh, physics uh, truthful thing, because uh, in physics, you know, there is a motor that uh, transmits its torque to, to some belt and the belt throughout its uh, like uh, tension uh, transmits the power to the contact points between the track and the soil. So this is, this is not how this model uh, does it. This model actually works this around by specifying the resulting uh, velocity and asking the simulator to compute the forces that would result in such velocity. So this is still a kind of workaround. It's still not the physically uh, plausible model, but uh, as we showed in the IRS paper, it is like the most plausible uh, that is available from all the presented models. Uh, regarding the integration, it's usually pretty easy. Uh, in Gazebo Classic, it's available in both versions 9 and 11. Uh, you just add this plugin, lib simple track vehicle plugin, uh, specify what is the body, uh, the body of the robot. Uh, that's because you need to compute the instantaneous sensor of rotation. So you also need to know where the body is relative to the, to the links, uh, to the tracks. And then you specify what are the tracks. Uh, you can even specify like multiple left tracks and multiple right tracks. 
uh, steering efficiency. We talked about that, and then you just tell it uh, how far the tracks are, and that's it. Uh, you can also specify some gains or limits, and uh, that's basically it. You have the track vehicle setup. Uh, Implementation-wise, uh, the the logic of adjusting the friction surface parameters happens in before physics update event, uh, which is a nice feature of Gazebo Classic. Uh, that there is a phase where first contacts are determined, but they do not uh, do anything with the physics yet. Uh, you can then access the contacts, change their parameters, and then there is the physics update step, which actually uh, does all the physics computations. So in Ignition uh, and in Gazebo Classic, this was uh, pretty fairly easy. Uh, in Ignition Gazebo, I decided to split the plugin in actually two plugins. One is Track Controller, which is uh, just the, like the track controller that's uh, controlling a single track. Uh, you can also imagine it like a conveyor belt. And then you can merge multiple of these track controllers into something that behaves like a track vehicle. And that is the thing that computes the instantaneous center of rotation and uh, reacts to CMD well and these things. So. Oh no, did we lose Martin? Okay. Um, let's give him a couple minutes to- He, he just came oh. back. Yeah, okay, there he is. I'm sorry, it seems that the panel crashed somehow. <laughs> This can only happen during a presentation. So did you see this part with the integration in English and Gazebo? Yeah. Yeah. OK. So yeah. But implementation-wise, it was a much uh, harder thing to do in Ignition Gazebo because there is no separation between the contact determination and the physics computation. So. What I ended up doing is uh, firing an event every time a contact is created and asking Gazebo, like all the way through uh, Dart, IGN Physics, IGN Gazebo, then the plugin. So asking the plugin in Gazebo uh, what should happen to this contact and then passing all the information back. So it's kind of like uh, pretty complicated stuff, but it ended up in uh, subscribing to an event called collect contact surface properties, where you get all the determined properties of the contact. You can adjust the surface parameters where the friction direction or relative motion of the bodies can be specified. And then the resulting adjusted structure is passed back to Dart. And because this event-driven reaction to contacts can be uh, somehow expensive, uh, you also need to explicitly allow uh, the contact surface customization for each entity, which is like collision of a robot uh, that you want to be customized in this way. And it seems to me I haven't yet done any like performance tests with a large collection of links uh, using this, but uh, at least for the normal use cases of several tracked robots in one simulation, I didn't actually see any performance drop compared to the wheeled workaround we used before. Uh, to see the plugin in action, uh, there is a pull request to the sub T simulator, uh, which will hopefully be merged in a few days. And uh, there are these five tracked vehicles available in sub T simulator. All of them were using the uh, wheeled workaround. So I took all of these vehicles and basically converted their tracks to the like proper shapes of the collisions and uh, made them using the tracked vehicle plugin. And uh, yeah, you can also use this plugin for easy simulation of conveyor belts, finally. So people doing some simulations of industrial manufacturing uh, facilities could be also interested in this because I think normally what, what the people did was pushing some external force to the box. And here instead, you just specify the speed of the, of the belt and it induces the forces that are needed for the box to move itself. So I think this could also, if 
find some usage. And to show you one more usage example, uh, my colleague Taymor Azayev has already been using this uh, tracked vehicle plugin for machine learning. He is training the tracked vehicle to steer the flippers, the, the moving tracks, so that it is able to climb over obstacles somehow easily. And he was always complaining that it's quite impossible or just a matter of luck if the wheel workaround vehicle would climb up the stairs. And as you can see here, for example, climbing up the stairs is no more a problem. And he's now much happier with the track, uh, with the tracks uh, simulated more properly. And that's about it. I'll now let uh, a video playing we did for the IRS paper. That's kind of like comparison of all the uh, simulation models we have found with a real vehicle. So we kind of like recorded the commanded velocity and recorded the pose of the robot and tried to simulate it uh, the best we could with all the models and compared how, how do the simulations behave. And the contact surface motion model was kind of like one of the best uh, in most cases. So that's it. Uh, I can let this video playing in background and now it's time for our questions. Nice, thank you, Martin. Thank you for, for all of the, the work and thank you for the presentation. That was very nice. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Martin? I was I was going to ask you how uh, closely simulation compared to real life, but it looks like you already did that in your paper. So this is something that we can read and get that kind of information from. Yeah, I think this paper still has, uh, lacks something because we did not use any kind of like uh, precise external localization system. We didn't use didn't use any Wiken or things like that. We just use a SLAM to uh, localize the robot, which was yeah, you know. Slime usually works if you don't do silly movements with the robot, uh, but it could still be uh, much more precise. And on the other hand, uh, yes, I spent some time configuring all of the models of the robots in the simulation, but you know, if you tried harder, you would always find a better set of parameters that would uh, work for these cases that were tested. So. It's still hard to determine how much of the difference was because I just did not find the right set of parameters and how much was because the model lacks itself. But yeah, I think uh, in the sub-T simulation, all of us have seen that the wheeled approximation for robots is really, really bad. And it seemed to me that most of the virtual challenge teams actually did not use the, the fake Correct vehicles, and maybe that was one of the one of the reasons. I don't know. Yeah, yeah there's probably also other reasons related to how the scoring structure was set up to favor certain vehicles over others. Yeah, but, yeah, yes. sure. But we were actually uh, thinking about using the one of our tracked vehicles in the simulation, but then we found out that, okay, it's not even possible to climb up stairs with it. So it's of no better value than the wheeled ones. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I have a question about the, the implementation comparing Gazebo Classic to Ignition. Um, it sounds like the Gazebo Classics API made it a little bit easier for you to like go into the physics engine and uh, insert like the, the logic that you needed. And then on Ignition, you needed to take the event-based approach to kind of work around Ignition Physics API or? Um... Uh, yeah, I think the approach used in Ignition Gazebo is kind of like uh, more general uh, in the thing that it does not require the physics engine to actually distinguish between the contact determination phase and the physics update phase. So as soon as a contact is uh, created in the physics engine, uh, it can pass it to Gazebo and ask if there should be some adjustments done to the contact and then the contact is returned back. So this is kind of like more general, but uh, yeah, with generality comes complexity. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I was going to ask like if maybe you, you think that there could be any um, 
refactoring of ignition physics that we could do to make it easier. But it sounds like we are gaining. Uh, it's a clear gain uh, in generality that we that we have. Maybe there. not performance wise, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, uh, usage wise definitely. And the refactoring would need to happen in the art itself. So I think that would be even more complicated. Got it. And another question that I have is, um, have you looked into doing this for Bullet or are you done? <laughs> uh, not yet. <laughs> uh, it's possible okay. I will have a look. Yeah, but not, not in the few months that are coming. Or maybe, I, I'm not even sure if Bullet already uh, supports in Ignition Gazebo everything that's actually needed to get this kind of vehicle moving. Because I know it still lacks some features, but uh, I haven't looked uh, very thoroughly through it. Yeah, bullet is still early stages, but it has a lot of a lot of the basic functionalities there already. Any other questions for Martin before we go to ne the next presentation? Yeah, one quick one. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that the this approach is purely velocity based and doesn't ha you can't do like force feedback. Is there? I suspect it's probably heavy and very hard to do this. Um, but is there any path forward that you could see to actually get into the physics solver so you're setting the velocity, but you've got some level of feed, feedback on force that you could allow it to stall out or something like that? Yeah, that's a, that's a hard one, yeah. I can, I can chime in here a little bit. Yeah. So, okay. so it is, it is um, you do set a velocity command, but it's not like, it, it uses the physics solver um, and basically in the friction constraint, you know, normal, a normal friction constraint is trying to drive the velocity to zero. But I, my understanding is that this parameter, it lets you override what the solver is trying to drive the velocity to. So that's why, like the conveyor belt example, um, it's just doing normal, um, like contact between a box and a, you know, falling on a flat surface, but the solver is saying, okay, the, we're going to, you know, try to resolve the friction forces to drive this thing to be moving at X meters per second or whatever you set the parameter to. So it can still slip. It's not like you're um, just overriding the velocity. It is using, it is using the solver and it is using the friction yeah, parameters. Yeah, sure. That, that's it. So uh, even though I somehow like uh, change the right hand side of the equation to not zero, but zero point something or whatever you set as the target velocity, slippage and friction and all of these things are still applied. So if the friction, for example, is too low to get the vehicle moving and that vehicle, it will, it will slip and so on. But yeah, there is no force feedback in the in the way that you would say, okay, my tracks are only this strong, and uh, if you needed uh, higher torque to to get the desired motion, uh, don't do that. So this is not the kind of thing that would be easily extracted. I think that would need the ability to read out like the computed resulting forces from the dynamics engine, which would be a very nice feature. But I haven't yet seen a way to do it. And yeah, I, I was always dreaming of like, okay, I would now like to visualize this force in gazebo, but yeah, that's not possible if it's not an external force. So maybe that's an inspiration for some like physics engine guru to provide an API to read, read back the forces that were computed. Maybe with the contact sensor, you could get those forces, but yeah, it's, uh, it would take a little bit of work to figure out what value you want to display. Oh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I think we can go to our next presentation. Uh, Jay Young is going to talk about PX4 autopilot integration into Ignition Gazebo. So the floor is yours, Jay. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, my name is Jay Young Lim. Um, today I'll talk about um, uh, the integration into Ignition Gazebo for uh, PX4 uh, software in the loop simulations. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, so I'm currently a PhD candidate of um, 
UK Zurich, and I currently work on um, inform information gathering, path planning for, uh, in the context of avalanche monitoring. And I'm currently the subcomponent sub maintainer and simulation for the PX4 autopilot project. So some of you might not be uh, familiar with PX4 autopilot. Um, I'll go quickly through um, uh, what it is and how we are using uh, the gazebo simulation. Um, so it it's currently uh, one of the uh, widely used open source autopilot projects that powers um, uh, op uh, um, small area unmanned aerial vehicles. And it started as um, a uh, student team at ETH Zurich uh, um, participating in the European micro air vehicle competition. And they actually uh, made the code public during the uh, competition and other teams started using it um, with this small um, coaxial helicopter. And that's how um, currently it has become a global open source um, community that's um, um, not just used for um, hobbyists, but also in a lot of um, commercial systems in uh, various uh, shapes and sizes not just multi-rotors, but also uh, fixed wing and uh, VTOL vehicles. Um, so the ignition integration was done while I was working at um, a company called Arterian, which provides um, enterprise uh, um, software and um, services based on the PX4 autopilot project. Um, so I joined as a second intern in this company and it has been growing very rapidly after that. Uh, which was um, a great experience on my side. Um, so PX4 runs on um, a hardware standard called PixOx. Um, so a PixOx, uh, you can look at the website, um, is a, a standard and not a, a name of a product. So a lot of, uh, there's a vast uh, ecosystem of various manufacturers actually manufacturing um, PixOx compatible autopilots um, and if, um, you will also see some autopilots that have similar names, for example, PixHack, which doesn't exactly um, follow the PixHack reference standard, uh, but will might as well be as good, but more uh, tailored for the use case um, that they're interested in. Um, a lot of people uh, actually confuse PixHawk with um, PX4. So PixHawk is the hardware reference standard and you can flash um, other software to the PixHawk hardware. Uh, for example, there's another uh, great open source community called um, Artipilot that is also, um, that you can also run on uh, PixHawk autopilots. Um, one unique thing about um, having a open source autopilot is that um, the whole um, ecosystem of various use cases, they all run a uh, share the same infrastructure, such as the flight control software, communication and ground control station software. So you actually are able to seamlessly um, use different types of vehicles for different use cases using very similar uh, infrastructure. Um, so why do we care about um, simulation? So um, simulation is quite extensively used in the PX4 autopilot project, uh, mainly to uh, demonstrate behaviors if you are an operator and you want to update your software version, you would like to test the uh, new versions of software in a more compartmentalized and safe environment. So they, you, you would usually want to test new features uh, um, in simulation without um, risking your vehicle. It's also a great tool for developers. Um, it greatly speeds up your development cycle. Um, obviously, uh, especially for aerial vehicles, you usually need a, a, a large area and safe space to fly and um, reducing the frequency of doing flight tests um, greatly enhances your productivity. Uh, one of the most important use cases I would say is that um, when uh, for every software changes, um, the software is verified in simulation uh, in software in the loop. Um, uh, 
and in for all vehicle targets and in various um, environments and um, scenarios um, and uh, it is run faster than real time so you can actually rapidly uh, get feedback of what the impact of change um, you made since um, some of the changes you made for a specific vehicle type might um, uh, propagate to induce errors on uh, other use cases that you might have not thought of. So PX4 um, supports various simulators. Um, so classical gazebo being one of the most uh, widely used simulators um, and which is also used for uh, software verification in our um, CI, uh, but also um, JMAFSIM, which is a much more lightweight simulator um, that you can test even if your system is not powerful uh, or um, JSP SIM, which uh, provides uh, more uh, complex aerodynamic models um, for uh, vehicles that have uh, complex aerodynamic effects such as uh, fixed wing or VTOL vehicles. And also the Microsoft AirSim, which uh, provides an environment for photorealistic uh, simulation if you, if you need that for your uh, image pipeline. So uh, PX4 is currently integrated into um, ignition gazebo, uh, uh, sorry, uh, ignition gazebo edifice. Um, and you can find the source code um, on the following link. So as you see in the video, um, you can see the vehicle flying uh, with uh, the ground control station software, which is Q ground control. Um, and the ground control station software actually does not know whether you're flying a real vehicle or um, a simulated vehicle. And this, uh, this sort of uh, native, uh, because it's using the same interface, which is the Mavlink communication protocol. And this sort of nativeness really provides you um, the capability to test your uh, sort of end user application without the real vehicle. And um, then actually running this with a real vehicle becomes very seamless. Um, how this is run is we have a Gazebo Mavlink interface plugin, which um, uh, talks to the PX4 flight stack through um, a uh, set of uh, Mavlink messages, which is normally called Hill Sensor or Hill Actuator or um, other various sensor messages. And um, the Gazebo Mavlink interface distributes the information uh, through other uh, Ignition plugins. Um, PX4 itself is um, itself uh, pops up has a pops up messaging system called UORB, which is similar to ROS. Um, and so by uh, the flight stack and the simulator talking through this, this Mavlink message and internally in PX4, these information is redistributed for the relevant models through this uh, UORB messaging bus. Um, the simulation is run on um, lockstep. Um, so the way this is done is that um, the flight stack sends um, HIL, uh, HIL stands for hardware in the loop. So HIL actuator controls to the flight stack. Um, uh, sorry, the flight stack sends the actuator controls to, to the simulator and then the simulator um, runs the actuate, simulates the actuators and then uh, returns to the flight stack uh, information of the various sensor measurements and then only after the flight stack has received these um, sensor values, it um, sends back the actuator values. And this is how um, the simulator and the flight stack is always in sync. Um, and this helps a lot um, to resolve the inconsistencies of that comes from uh, if your, for example, um, simulation is not in sync, uh, performance differences with uh, different setups of uh, people's uh, systems. Um, you can actually just um, run the simulation quite conveniently. You just need to clone the Pixel Autopilot project and run this make target. Uh, just do make PX4 SIDL um, ignition and you'll be able to run the simulation example that um, I've shown before. Uh, PX4 also provides a headless um, 
option so you can just set an environment variables and it would not run the ignition uh, gazebo client and this is what's basically being used in uh, sort of these continuous integration testing environments that you don't actually render the environment and you can also speed up um, the simulation more efficiently um, what is quite nice about this is that um, this act so for example if you're developing something on top of uh, your aerial vehicle um, you just need to talk to the flight stack th through your end user uh, uh, sort of for example an autonomy stack or a user application and this uh, sort of the simulation and also the px4 uh, flight stack running abstracts the actual vehicle so you actually do not need to do um, any additional integration when you're moving from simulation to the real vehicle. You basically just need to you need to uh, change the address of where you're sending your data to. And this it also uh, scales well since um, PXO supports uh, various kinds of vehicles, and uh, you can also test in simulation um, these. Uh, how, how your user app um, is going to work um, in, in various scenarios. For example, very windy environments or uh, different locations of the earth with different uh, magnetic declinations, um, which could often be a problem. Um, so uh, basically this uh, effort into uh, making Ignition Gazebo work was um, not uh, implemented from scratch, but uh, we are trying to move over our um, classical Gazebo software in the loop framework into Ignition Gazebo um, for, and we would like to actually, um, uh, if possible, uh, move over the uh, continuous continuous integration stack in the future um, since uh, Ignition Gazebo would be replacing the classical Gazebo um, in the foreseeable future. Um, so the, obviously the, uh, the structure of Gazebo and Ignition Gazebo is quite different. Um, so previously um, you would define some kind of uh, a plugin type, for example, a sensor plugin um and just uh have these load and on update states where load would be um on load time configuring your plugin and on update uh to run your sensor models or your dynamics model during runtime while um ignition gazebo has uh, quite a different api and um also the distinction between the pre-update and post-update um uh the Porting was not, uh, I would say, straightforward, but uh, rather a, a re-implementation. Um, so these were the um, sort of plugin structures we had. So we had um, uh, model plugins and um, sensor plugins, also world plugins, for example, wind um, is configured uh, not dependent on the model itself, but um, belongs to the world itself so that if you have multiple vehicles being simulated in the world that the uh, wind would be um, shared and um, I guess not the intention of the gazebo implementation but the model plugin and sensor plugin is basically um, something that is uh, uh, mixed use so not uh, distinguished semantically but um, usually the mock-up plugins or uh, plugins that we run in the CI is usually on model plugins and in case your sensor kind of needs to support um, multiple uh, sensors uh, we tend to use sensor plugins but these distinctions are uh, I would say not um, not very uh, clearly defined um, and for our um, ignition gazebo uh, integration um, we only we have only yet ported like the minimum set of plugins um, also due to the sort of integration um, efforts that needs needed that is needed to um, port the plugins um, but these are the minimum sets of plugins that we ported and we are trying to use the 
for example, the IMU or the motor models, um, the ones that are actually um, existing inside the ignition gazebo. So if you look at the classical classical gazebo side, we are using, uh, we were not using any of the um, sort of IMU or uh, or motor model plugins that already exist in classical gazebo. Uh, but we have redundant plugins since um, some of the plugins you sometimes had to uh, uh, integrate it in the uh, that is it is aware of what the firmware is going to do and um, hopefully on ignition gazebo we can handle this a bit more um, smartly um, so yeah in summary of the uh migrating to ignition gazebo has been yeah uh, basically uh since the uh structure of the plugins have changed we have we're still in work in progress on the various sensors um but we're trying to re-implement everything and probably uh, shake off the um, legacy uh things that we would like to get rid of in in, in the process and uh one of the big hurdles I would say left for us is that um, the sort of infrastructure is was built around um, sort of the structure of Gazebo Classics, which um, has changed in Ignition Gazebo. And um, so we are in the position that we, ha we basically have to redefine the infrastructure, redesign the infrastructure that um, is uh, general enough that it works uh, with Ignition Gazebo. Uh, but we are also very excited with the uh, new exciting features that uh, we would uh, the ignition gazebo would enable um one of the most exciting things would be related to the thermal camera and maybe the semantic camera plugin that recently went in where uh, with classical gazebo is very limited to be able to simulate um, image sensor which is one of the most important um, sensors for air vehicles and hopefully uh, by uh, integrating more into Ignition Gazebo, we can uh, be, we will be able to simulate more diverse missions um, in the simulation. Um, also, uh, one of the problems we recently ran into is that um, we started simulating uh, a Gazebo in real world environments, uh, uh, real world uh, locations. So for example, so that the ground station map would align actually what you see in gazebo. Um, obviously the problem is that if you load large environments, um, you either need a very powerful system or you need to have uh, a confined smaller environment. Uh, but with the um, levels feature, uh, we hope to have very large environments simulated um, since aerial vehicles would always uh, be flying in large areas. Um, so that's uh, basically most it for the presentation. This is a small demo um, of the software in the loop running in the tunnel environment of Ignition Gazebo. Um, and while this is playing, I think we can move over to questions. Um, if anyone. Oh, thank you, Jay. That was very nice. Um, does anyone have questions? Go, Michael. Yeah, I was going to see, have you begun actively integrating Ignition Gazebo into your CI? Um, and if so, have you seen any of the stuff about uh, EGL that might be interesting in some of your CI applications? Um, uh, so the answer would be no, um, because we're actually missing too many plugins for now that we um, we the, uh, we would not be really adding um, anything to the current CI infrastructure. Um, and uh, yes, so like uh, we are simulating 250 hertz simulation at 30 times real time in our current infrastructure. And I think that's why we had to, until now, turn off the rendering in general and go around this issue by having mock-up plugins. Um, 
but yes, I'm, I'm not sure if EGL would be able to be a solution for this. Um, it would be interesting to look into. Is, is the list you showed earlier kind of the comprehensive uh, list of, of what you would need to switch over? Um, I guess we're always interested in knowing where the gaps are, right? Uh -huh. um, not exactly. So there's a lot of plugins that are not run in the CI. Um, for example, um, things like parachute, um, you don't need to simulate it to know that your parachute system is going to work. Um, but certainly um, most of the navigation sensors, for example, um, GPS, airspeed sensors, optical flow sensors um, are the funny ones where it's kind of not really uh, needs a rendering, but the, but the actual plugin runs rendering to compute the optical flow. And, um, but yeah, most of the sensors that are actually used in the real vehicles are actually implemented in classical gazebo. And yeah, we would like to test as much as we can. Steve. Thanks. I, I posted my question in the chat, but it's mainly a question about your user community and what um, development uh, platforms do they prefer to use specifically operating system. Um, I've noticed that you seem to have some Mac OS users. Um, so I was just curious if that is a, a big part of your developer community. Um, yes, so I would say we have several groups of different use cases since um, a real vehicle is not just about the vehicle itself, but also um, around the services that evolve around it. So um, certainly for um, firm flight control developers, I think we mostly use Ubuntu, also robotics developers, of course, um, since it's more convenient to use ROS. Um, but uh, so one of the reasons PX4 does not want uh, does not depend on try not to depend on uh, Ubuntu is that a lot of the ground control software or um, services like web uh, based um, services they a lot of developers are on either Windows or Mac OS um, so I think especially the, the uh, recent uh, uh, PXO software in the loop users on Mac OS are mainly uh, these uh, app developers that kind of need a simulated vehicle that actually behave like a real vehicle, but um, obviously without the hardware. And I think those are most of the Mac users um, or um, the most important ones that we care about. Right? I see. Um, I, yeah, I wonder if uh, how well our homebrew bottles have been, um, how reliable they've been for you. But that, you know, that's kind of a, maybe a side conversation. I don't know. Yeah, um, I would actually love to talk about this, uh, discuss this, um, yeah, if you have time. I'm, I'm not, uh, not really a Mac user, so um, I have been doing very poorly on maintaining this part of uh, PX4, but obviously, um, Gazebo is the most used um, simulator for PX4, and it would be nice if um, this part of the community is well maintained. Thank you. Um, do you have a follow up, Steve? Sorry. No, just saying that we can follow up another, after the meeting about that. Great, thanks. Um, Kashap Joshi left a uh, question in the chat. Uh, Kashap, if you want to. Um, say it, uh, just speak up, otherwise I'll just read it here. Um, is it possible that we can run the vehicle in real world and at the same time we can map its movement uh, in Gazebo Classic or Ignition Gazebo? And, and if yes, which data would be preferable to provide to a QGround control application? Um, he, so it's open source, um, anything is possible, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, to answer your question, uh, I don't think there is um, a way to kind of replay uh, your vehicle mission. Um, so you can certainly uh, have a log and 
um, a replay your estimator logs or a log itself, but um, this would not include um, the Mavlin communication and also handshaking with QGround control. Um, so this would not would be kind of ab absent. Um, Thank you. Um, thank you, Jay, again for the presentation. Uh, awesome stuff. Let us know if there's anything that we can do on our side to facilitate the work that you're doing, um, if we can improve our sensors so you don't have to reinvent them uh, again when you're porting everything to Ignition, things like that. Uh, we're very open to, to collaborating there. Really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thanks for the awesome simulator. Uh, ignition gazebo re really looks nice. So I'm quite excited. That's, that's great to hear. Um, cool. So I'll share my screen real quick right now just for the final uh, news. Um, let's see. So CAD uh, curated some news for us here uh, about Ignition and Gazebo for um, the, the past months, I guess, because we haven't had one of these for a while. So. Um, there's a lot of good stuff uh, out there. There are uh, a couple of videos here explaining how to use Gazebo, both Gazebo Classic and Ignition Gazebo together with uh, ROS2, uh, which I think it's interesting for a lot of people. Um, there are a couple of videos from Roscon Japan uh, so that uh, are in Japanese, but they, they have a, a lot of very cool stuff like this one here um, shows uh, the simulation of robots inside Gazebo actually digging the ground and uh, like removing ground and, and moving into other parts of the simulation, which is something that a lot of people have wanted to do in Gazebo for a long time. So I recommend people who are interested in that use case, check it out. Um, and, uh, you know, there, this is the video of our uh, last month's community meeting. Uh, this is another one from Roscon Japan about simulating a giant Gundam uh, in Gazebo. So I recommend people uh, check out all of these new links here that Kat uh, put together for us. Um, before closing up, does anyone want to talk about something real quick for less than three minutes? If not, I'll just thank our speakers again. Uh, that was very nice. Both presentations were very nice. Thank you for everybody who asked questions. Uh, oh, Kat uh, pointed out there here in the chat that VRX 2022 deadline is extended for another 24 to 48 hours. So uh, if you are planning on, on uh, participating in that, like you still have some time. Martin, you're up. Yeah, uh, OK, I'll ask. Uh because probably a lot of uh, relevant people are here. Um, what are the plans with the SubT simulator when SubT is over? I, I still see some development there, uh, trials to port it to Fortress. So is there is that going to be some kind of like showcase of the Ignition Gazebo or what are the plans for future? Yeah, I, I can take this one. Um, so the, the plan is to uh, uh, wrap up as many pull requests on the public repo as possible and also migrate everything to Fortress so that it has a long-term um, support uh, at least up to what is Fortress 2025 or something later? 2025 uh, is Citadel, thing. so one year more, I think. One more year, okay. Uh, and then um, if you were an active participant in the uh, sub-T challenge, you still have access to um, the sub-T portal and running on uh, uh, submitting solutions to CloudSim via that mechanism. And we are working on porting that same logic to our um, the Ignition web app, and you'll be able to run there. The caveat would be if you haven't uh, participated in well, if you use the Ignition app website, you'll have to pay for your time, essentially. And that's just to basically cover costs, AWS costs. So that's our yeah, path sure. forward. Because, you know, as we were looking at it, we think that this could kind of like become one of nice benchmarks for like multi-robot exploration or things like that. And uh, definitely, if, if you write a paper on multi-robot exploration, you use some kind of like simplified simulations. Uh, where you don't simulate sensors and these things, 
but the sub t simulator is really like the integrated thing that uh, shows that uh, you can connect all of the pieces together we think this is still nice so yeah that's keep that's it, keep it at the life is pretty pretty good yeah yeah that's great to hear we're we're looking to keep it um alive as as long as we we possibly can so yeah write papers against it and encourage people to use it um it'd be great to see what improvements we can make okay thanks oh thank you everyone so time's up uh thank you everyone who joined again i'll just remind everybody that we don't have a meeting at the end of december so we'll meet again in the end of january as always if you want to speak at one of these meetings or you want to uh, ask for some topic to be discussed like just just reach out to us uh through various means uh gazebo community um email github you know you can find us okay thank you everyone yeah.